even by myself, I probably couldn't do it. Six or seven. Yeah. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Okay. We're gonna we're gonna start out with some historical things connecting us from Magdeburg to America. Uh, after that, this one will be structured just a little bit differently than the previous two, and, and likely the last one. And that I'll leave more time for questions than usual to make sure we're all on the same page, and also that the questions that have been popping up in your mind as we've gone along so far, and as we'll go along this hour, uh, are getting answered or at least in some measure addressed, if not definitively resolved. Because we'll take it from Europe and the 16th century to America uh, and our history now. In a certain sense, that's fairly easy. And the reason it's easy is that the principles, especially the doctrine of the lesser magistrate, laid out in the Magdeburg Confession are used by people who are very important in the founding of the United States. Not most of them, however, quote, founding fathers. The people who are important fall into kind of two different groups. One, this is kind of offhand, I'm not myself terribly interested in this question, but... Uh, a thinker very important for our founding fathers as a political philosopher, John Locke, is familiar with both French writers and their predecessors uh, elsewhere in Europe on the continent in their debates that Lutherans, Reformed, and Catholics are having about a right to resistance or maybe phrased more explosively a right to rebellion or in a way that would be recognizable to Locke to talk about popular sovereignty, the sovereignty of the people. Okay? And so when Locke talks in his two treatises on government, which is really enormously important for the American founders, he's going to talk in ways that are in some measure derived from Magdeburg and its principles about resistance to tyranny. Okay? That's all fairly dry stuff. Okay, that's why I'm going to kind of leave that aside unless you want to discuss that further in question time. The stuff that I'm more interested in is something that I've referenced already, but not talked about extensively, which is that because Lutheranism ends up being politically tolerated on the European continent, that the principles outlined in Magdeburg don't have to generally be applied thereafter especially of resistance, of military resistance, of taking up of arms against tyranny, doesn't have to be applied because it's basically okay to be Lutheran. It's not, in most cases, okay to be what we would now call Reformed. And especially in France, at various times, it is explicitly illegal to have those convictions, to worship in accord with those convictions. This gets called, I think, somewhat euphemistically, the French Wars of Religion, which happened throughout the later, you know, kind of back end of the 16th, the beginning of the 17th centuries. The reason I think it's a euphemism is that the slaughter is almost entirely on one side. The Protestants suffer much more than the much larger majority, with state backing, Roman Catholics suffer. Okay? But the Protestants will therefore, who are going to be called eventually after one of their earliest leaders, Huguenots, the Protestants have to think about why are we militarily resisting the burning down of our churches or our forcible expulsion and scattering so we can no longer gather for worship or any other of number of things controlling both conscience but also body. You're forcing me not to live here anymore. You're deporting me from my own land, in many cases. So Huguenots will actually scatter over large parts of Europe. They become formative in the founding, not only, especially of South Carolina in the United States, but really all over the United States. John Jay, for example, is of Huguenot descent. Um, if you have colonial American ancestry, you probably have at least one Huguenot ancestor, even if your last name isn't French. Okay? So they scatter. Uh, there's a lot of them in South Africa. 
why are we why why are we resisting? Is it okay to do what we are doing? Okay. So they will come up with theories of resistance, explicit defenses based on Magdeburg. There are other links here, other thinkers, but in a simplified version, they are the ones that have to put into practice the principles especially of resistance outlined in the Magdeburg Confession, explained there, defended there. Okay. The way that that comes down to the United States is not only through the personal example uh, or existence of Huguenots uh, in certain parts of the American colonies, but also in the reading of somebody like John Adams, not only of Locke, whom I mentioned, but other thinkers about politics, will be the idea that it is actually okay and, in fact, basic to the protection of God-given rights, God-given rights, that not only magistrates, but also common people should resist tyranny, even taking up arms against it when necessary. Think about it in this way. The American colonies are almost entirely Protestant, okay? Almost entirely. It's a very small percentage of Roman Catholics. So the theological heritage is fairly uniform. They're almost entirely Protestant. Something that you'll notice is that the debate in the 1750s, 1760s, early 1770s is not, notice what's not being debated, is it okay to resist? That's not a debate they're having. The debate that they're having is how should we resist and how much? That's the debate. Not is it okay to resist? Notice how much the terms of debate have changed. Right? In the present day, we're now working with a legal instrument called an executive order, which in the case of a federal vaccine mandate has not actually been issued, but a legal document of an executive order is intended to regulate the executive branch of the federal government. It's not an order. There's, there's no such thing as the executive of the federal government ordering a private citizen of one of the states to do anything in particular. That's not what an executive order is, even legally speaking, even though all of this, I want to point out, is hypothetical because the president hasn't issued his vaccine mandate. It is a press release. Okay? So you know that. So, but notice this. Notice that people are taking seriously the idea that the executive of the, of the, the nation would tell them personally what to do. So you're really far from the political culture of the American colonies where nobody's debating that you can resist such an authority. That's not a debate. Okay. Now, the formation of how power works in modern America is something that we'll talk about, especially in our last lecture this evening. But notice that he really the function of, the exec of any executive order, even if applied to individual people working for private companies, is that because they know that constitutionally they can directly tell you what to do, it just has no constitutional justification, they're going to try to pressure your employer into telling you what to do. Because, just like we said, Luther didn't have to deal with the media, the Founding Fathers weren't dealing with multinational corporations telling you what to do with your body or your life. So there are lots of things that have come about that have lots of power in our society that have no legal justification but therefore also no legal address or, or means of redress with which our founders would have been familiar. They're familiar with a situation where the major problem would be a tyrant and nobody's debating whether you could resist him. The question would just be, what's the timeline, and what are the means of redress we will use? So you have, on the one hand, someone like John Dickinson, 
who's the writer of the Olive Branch Petition, saying this is, this is what's happened to us, laying out, indeed, a lot of the things that will actually be enumerated in the Declaration of Independence. But we're not seeking to declare independence yet. We want you to address these things. The Declaration simply differs in what you're going to do about the problems everyone sees. So the debate is on a spectrum of resistance to tyranny. The theological justification for that debate is a common Protestant understanding shared by Lutherans, Reformed, and then others that will come to be much more important in American history, especially in the South, precisely because the Anglican Church doesn't send enough priests. You realize that ethnically the people that settle the South should be Anglicans. They should be. If we were going by Germans are Lutheran and Italians are Catholic and people with English names are supposed to be Anglicans, but they're not because they didn't send enough ministers. The Baptists and the Methodists evangelize these people who have been stranded, basically, by the church that's supposed to take care of them. All of those groups, whether they're in the 17th century or coming about later, all of those groups agree human beings have consciences. Human beings have immortal souls. Human beings have bodies. And governments have limits, therefore, as to what they can do about those consciences, souls, and bodies. And about the soul and the conscience, they really can do and ought to do very little. The revolution, for instance, does not abolish all state churches. So when you're talking about, for instance, what we would call or what Jefferson calls in his letter to the Danbury Connecticut Baptists, to set the wall of separation between church and state. Not everyone means the same thing by that. Everyone understands they are distinct. But, for example, in this way, what does the First Amendment to the, to the federal constitution therefore outlaw? It doesn't outlaw state churches. Because <laughs> Connecticut still had one until 1818, and Massachusetts still had one until 1833. It outlaws the federal government from having a state church, from making any establishment of religion. Okay. That was uncontroversial, really. Uncontroversial. The reason it was uncontroversial is because of the common theological understanding of politics common to Protestant Christians, okay? which does include Lutherans. First Speaker of the House of Representatives is a Muhlenberg, the son of a Lutheran pastor from Pennsylvania. Okay? That, right? Pennsylvania being sort of the origin of Lutherans in the United States and moving down through the Shenandoah Valley down to this area, um, the Henkels, uh, several of them being born in Pennsylvania. So that's where that all comes from. They're participating in this common political culture. Everybody agrees with these principles that we've outlined in the first two lectures about soul and body and conscience. What do I want to address now is how our specific church body, the Missouri Synod, which comes later than all of that, plays into this. And the reason I want to address that is because in what remains of this lecture, but also especially in the next one, I want to critique us in several ways, but also to offer some prospects for where we can go from here, both individually, but also as a church body. Things I wish we were doing more or less of. And it's not just sort of my, my Christmas list. It's things that I think would be theologically justified if we did more of them. We actually have these resources my contention, basically, in what remains of this lecture, is that we have, by and large, not utilized those theological resources. That's why, for example, it took a Reformed Episcopalian, um, as well as a couple uh, Calvinists, to get the Magdeburg Confession into English. We didn't do anything with it. Uh, there's a Concordia Publishing House book that's 17 years old about the Magdeburg Confession, but it wasn't in English, and we weren't really discussing it. Okay. So, the things that we've talked about in the first two lectures, I think, are largely a neglected inheritance. We have the land, the land is good, 
we didn't ever work the land, so nothing ever grew on it. But the land is ours. We should do something with it. So in what remains here, and I want to leave plenty of time this time for any questions that you had from the first two sessions or from this one, but I want to outline what happened when we did get here. And this leaves aside, honestly, the churches in this immediate area and their successors, which mostly uh, settled in Missouri and were the, the fathers of what's now called the English district. That is, English-speaking, native-born, confessional Lutherans, which now covers basically all of us here, but then covered basically just the Tennessee Synod and its heirs. The vast majority of the Missouri Synod is an immigrant church body. Uh, then, in language and in fact, and now, this is my contention, still in attitude. Here's what I mean by that. Why do they come here? They don't come here to understand the causes of the American Revolution or the political philosophy underneath it with its theological underpinnings that we've been discussing. They come here given two options, America or Australia, by the people looking for land for them to settle in order to live and, and be the way they want according to their understanding of the Bible, which at the time involves a very hierarchical form of church government, with the bishop telling you what to do, not only with, in church in every regard, but also where you're going to farm, who you're going to marry, how you're going to live. They try to form essentially a commune in rural Missouri. Okay? The way that our congregations are structured is a total reaction to that. Okay? That's a story for another time. They do have acquaintance, therefore, however, personally, with tyranny. If we had still had that form of church government in 2020, I can assure you, especially in your district, your churches would have been closed. Probably the whole year. I really don't have any qualms about saying that. They probably would have been closed the whole year, just like they were if you were Roman Catholic or Episcopalian or Eastern Orthodox, if the bishop decided that you were a public health risk or you needed to follow Romans 13, which means obeying all mandates, etc., whatever the case might have been, you would have been closed, the bishop would have been in charge. Go ahead. We would have had church at my house. Okay. <laughs> That's why. I mean... Yeah, God bless you and God bless the United States of America. But, right. but if you, if you, this is, that's the, that's the thing I brought up in the last lecture about centralization. I, I think it's not that decentralization is paradise. Because it puts that much more responsibility on the individual pastor and congregation to figure out what they're doing. So it's not for the faint of heart. However, it's generally better than someone who doesn't really know what is going on in your church telling you what to do in your church. So the problem of centralization and decentralization is that it's a church problem just like it's a state problem. Yeah, or a government problem. All right? But they want to do what they, you know, what they feel they should do according to the word of God. They have this whole crisis about how to run the church. There is a speech that CFW Walther gives many years after their crisis and after the founding of the LCMS in 1847 about what's great about America. And I mentioned this last night, but I'll reiterate it now. Really, the thing that they like about America is the existence of religious liberty. Okay? Okay. This is not precisely, understand this, this is not precisely the same thing as freedom of conscience. It is the freedom of them collectively to worship how they see fit. Okay? It's not that they don't maybe theoretically believe in freedom of conscience, it's that they don't really need to think as a group about 
what happens if the government infringes on your individual conscience, because you have to understand how little government mattered in the life of 19th century Americans, whether immigrants or native born. It simply didn't exist. It simply had nothing to do with you. Imagine not having a social security number, and there is no direct federal tax of any kind unless you pay tariffs as an importer or exporter. So you have nothing to, you may never see a government official except for the postmaster, <laughs> who is directly appointed by the President of the United States as a political favorite. That's it. You have nothing to do with the national government as a 19th century American by and large. Just has no bearing on your life. So they really don't have to think about infringement on individual conscience, generally speaking. And because the Missouri Synod had very few congregations in the southern United States at the time of the Civil War, they also didn't really think about what if we have to exist as a church under two different governments. Many American churches split at that time into two different churches. Some that remained the same suffered mightily for trying to remain one church under two different nations. Missouri Synod doesn't really have to deal with that. It is largely a, nor a northern and, you know, honestly, and we don't really remember it this way, but, but actually a majority urban church. It's a big church in places like Chicago and Milwaukee. Yeah, It's actually more urban than rural. And the, the single Missouri Synod chaplain who serves in the Civil War is brought in to do what by the state of Illinois? Minister in German <laughs> to German immigrants. So we're not livy, really living as a church body inside the mainstream of American life. And that's, that's just that's the history. That's okay. That's just the way it was. Therefore, we're not really looking to get into these political debates about freedom of conscience and secession. And it's, it's not a live issue among us. Where we begin to run into difficulties with government collectively are with state governments. And this is something that begins to happen as public education ramps up in all states after the Civil War. Okay? Public education becomes uh, compulsory in many northern states, uh, but available and relatively prevalent also even in southern states, which really didn't have common school systems prior to the Civil War, uh, also even in the South. And this is a place where not so much federal government, but government with a mandate where attendance is compulsory, begins to conflict with Something as basic as Lutheran schools, which are in almost every Lutheran congregation in the Missouri Synod uh, in the 19th century. Lutheran schools don't even follow the same school year, let alone the same curriculum. <laughs> Lutheran schools begin sometime in the fall, whenever the congregation and the teacher decide. But they definitely end at Palm Sunday which is when confirmation is, because that's when you're done with school. You're done going to school. You get confirmed. This is why a lot of the stuff with graduation and confirmation, at least historically for Lutherans, looks the same, <laughs> because it was the same, because you get confirmed, and then you're done going to school. Now, you're not theoretically done going to church, but you are an adult, and now you're going to go to work. You're done with eighth grade. That's it. So the school year ends at Palm Sunday in time for Easter. The pastor, who in half of our congregations was also the school teacher, was too busy. <laughs> so he stops right at his busiest point of the year with school, and he'll pick back up again in the fall. So we don't even line up in how we structure time with mainstream American life. The point where we really don't line up is not, is not in the 19th century a curriculum point, it's, it's a concern about immigration. 
that is a debate that is now rather entirely forgotten, but happens largely in <clears throat> northern states with large populations of immigrants. The first place that we have a severe conflict is in Wisconsin. There will, later on in the early 20th century, be a similar conflict in Nebraska. And it is about whether it is okay to instruct children in a language other than English. Because the state, it's going to argue, especially as government at all levels begins to claim larger powers after the American Civil War, of all kinds, not just, uh, you know, specifically the federal government over the states, but government at all levels has lots more power, lots more to do, grows exponentially after the Civil War and during it. So they say, we have a compelling interest in making sure that future citizens are fluent and competent for life in English. When you send your children to Lutheran schools, they don't learn how to do that. They learn whatever weird stuff it is that you teach them, but they definitely are not learning English. And a lot of our pastors and teachers are not actually competent to comply with this law because they're not really all that competent in English. In the 1880s, 1890s, a lot of our pastors and teachers are still first, I mean, they are immigrants themselves. So their English really is not that good. So, outlawing instruction in a language other than English in a, in a state with a lot of Lutheran immigrants effectively does what? It outlaws Lutheran schools. And because it effectively outlaws Lutheran schools, it effectively prevents Lutherans from educating their children as Lutherans, and therefore, in the view of the Lutheran Church, prevents us from carrying out what we have been given to do by God, which is raise our children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So, this is a story I'm sure you've never heard. We organize collectively to have our pastors in the relevant districts. I think Wisconsin is still one district then. Nebraska uh, might have been two at that time. It's now one. And we have the pastors tell the people to vote against these laws in church. Now, why would we not do that now? Because we're scared. <laughs> okay? And we don't want to lose our tactics of status. Okay? Because we're worried that that could swamp the building and lots of it, and we would lose a lot. But we do that because we understand that this will actually prevent us from carrying out. In some cases, we are not legislatively successful and we have to wait for redress in the courts. In other cases, we are legislatively successful, as in Wisconsin in the late 19th century, in getting the law overturned. Okay. And in that, we work with other people that have the same interests. Who else might have a compelling interest in parochial education in a language other than English? Take a wild guess. Roman Catholics. So like in Wisconsin, we will work with German and Italian Catholics, but especially German Catholics, in order to oppose that law. And it's really not because the Missouri Synod was real sweet on Roman Catholicism in the 1880s and then changed, I mean, <laughs> if you go back and read Reformation sermons, they're pretty much always just an extended denunciation of the Pope when he's not in the room, you know, that's, kind of, that's the sermon every year, you know. Uh, but it's that we have, a, we have a common political interest, so we will work with them in order to achieve that. Okay. So the major, the major run-ins with the state are generally about education and our capacity to educate our own children the way that we see fit. Now, within anyone, anyone's living memory, that has not been, at least officially or legally, threatened. Okay. Within almost everyone's lifetime in this room, there was a case where we had a run-in with the federal government, and you can find the arguments and the judicial opinion. Um, I think it went to a U.S. circuit court, um, and the LCMS won at that point. Um, but generally, I don't find that people are familiar with this case. In 1998, uh, the LCMS had a, a suit against, well, I mean, was sued by the Federal Communications Commission 
for violation of equal opportunity employment law because KFUO FM, which no longer exists, but KFUO is the synodical radio station. That's why the suit was against the LCMS corporately. Uh, the FM station was a classical music station, and the Federal Communications Commission under the Clinton administration said, you have not hired enough non-whites for your classical music station. And the LCMS basically made an argument that our listeners are overwhelmingly white, and the people available who know things about classical music and are interested and could be DJs or a classical station are also overwhelmingly white. So basically, what do you want? You know, what, what do you want here? What is interesting to me about that case, and you can go read it for yourselves, and it was, the, it was, it was found in favor of the LCMS, but there was definitely nervousness. They, they really were trying to apologize for hiring white people. I mean, they, they, were, they were embarrassed by it, but they, you know, they did prevail, okay? But something to notice is that they really did not argue that on the grounds, really, of religious liberty. They argued it on the grounds of, we've tried to comply as much as we can, you're asking too much in terms of compliance. You see the difference. We've already ceded the ground that if we have something foreign by the church, you can tell us what to do, we're just trying to tell you, we tried to do what you told us to do. You're being unreasonable about what you're asking us to do. Right? Because the church, theologically, has no compelling interest in a person of any particular ethnicity running the church's classical music station. Therefore, if those people happen to be, let's even say, 100% of you know, European descent, that's actually okay. We don't need to apologize for it. That's okay. That's fine. If I were running a salsa station, probably I'm not going to be a likely DJ on the church-run salsa station. That's okay. That's fine. Theologically, neither Jew nor Gentile matters for the church's affairs in this regard. Okay. So something that I think you can notice over time is that as we become Americanized, that is... We're born here, we speak English, we don't really speak German anymore, all this kind of stuff. I think one of the difficulties is that we don't take on the basic American constitutional arguments or their theological underpinnings for why American life is structured the way that it is. We just take on the idea that we want to be left alone. So we're worried about lawsuits. And when we are sued, we, we try to say we have cooperated as much as we possibly can. That was, is sort of our corporate understanding of what it means to be a good citizen. That's why I used the word attitude earlier when I said things that I would like to see changed. I want us to stop thinking almost as if we were immigrants and we're just worried that we're going to be bothered by people in this new country we don't understand. We've been here a while now. I wasn't raised in the LCMS. I've been here, we've, we've been here, my crowd has been here a long time, okay? This is my country. I'm not worried that they're going to kick me out or something, in a way that if I had just gotten here, I, maybe I can understand that would be rational. But I don't think we should behave the way that we did in the 19th century either, where we are outsiders, and we don't even honestly really understand the issues at play. I'll give you an example, and this is kind of a funny anecdote. When the vestry of, uh, kind of the elders and council of uh, Trinity St. Louis, which is the mother uh, congregation of the four that Walther is senior pastor of. You know, Missouri is a border state, so they're trying to understand, you know, why are, they, why are they ready to go to war against each other? You know. So what they do is they sit down with the Constitution and they try to decide, now there's something like right and wrong about this. They try to figure out from the Constitution whether the Civil War, like who's right, Okay. 
which is right in the sense that that is the governing document for the polity, but it's also wrong if you want to understand why people were really ready to shoot each other. Okay? That is, they get that there's this document that matters here, but they don't understand what would have pushed people over time to shoot at each other over something. They're looking, they're in America, but they look at it sort of from behind a partition, like it's not really their country. So they don't grasp all the issues at play. The extension of sovereignty. What is the nature of popular sovereignty, which is one of the questions in the frontier states, right? If enough Southerners move into a place, does that get to be a slave state? Or if we pack enough New Englanders into Kansas, does that, is that going to be a free state? Should popular sovereignty prevail? They don't really grasp any of that. They're outsiders to this country. If we are not, and this comes back to the question of vocation, if we are not, what is the nature of not being an outsider to this nation? I'm saying that the nature of not being an outsider is also not taking for granted that when the government says something, your conscience just flies right out the door. And you just listen to whatever they say. That was never the idea. Remember the debate in the founding of our country is about when and how much to resist, not whether you can or whether you should. Okay. And I think that very often when in our church we talk about government, we still frame it very unfortunately in terms that Ben Franklin in 1753 condemned German Lutherans for thinking it. So he's concerned about German immigration to Pennsylvania, okay? <laughs> so you can find this. It's a letter written to Peter Collinson, if you want to find it under that name. Ben Franklin writes, and he says, They don't understand our form of government. They have no acquaintance with freedom. Now, watch what he says they do. So they don't really know what they're doing when we have elections or anything like that, because <clears throat> they're not acquainted with actually making decisions on their own. But when they are given any kind of freedom, as they do over their pastors, they are unusually cruel because they don't know how to handle authority. <laughs> so they depose their pastors unjustly, but they don't make very good citizens either because they're just not acquainted with liberty. <laughs> okay. okay, so let's not let that be true anymore if it was in fact true in 1753. Okay? In America, your calling as a citizen is to have a conscience and to exercise your liberties of conscience, which are secured to you by our Constitution and a government that accords with it, but we never claimed were given to you by the Constitution or by the government. Those things are intended to secure things that were given to you by God. Like a right to life. So, if you take away anything from this weekend, everything that I'm saying is really just applying all the stuff that we've been saying about babies since the 1970s to your conscience and your soul. Very simple. Because that has always been the basic American contention on the basis of things that are not only, you know, in some of our cases, our, you know, genealogical forebears, but certainly in all cases, our theological forebears themselves argued for. My life is not determined in state or church simply because some human being says so. It is determined by what God says, and then a government in the state, and a way of life in the church in accordance with what God says. Known in the state, especially through reason. Known in the church, through the revealed word of God. Very simple. Secured to me, I hope, in the church, for instance, by confessions. So the church doesn't get to say whatever it wants to say. It needs to say what it has determined over time, the Bible says. The state doesn't get to do whatever it wants to do. It needs to do what is in accord with the Constitution 
and the Bill of Rights, which is set there for the securing of liberties. But the liberties are not there because they gave them to me or can take them away. And this is a gap in our immediate, not our European, but our American Lutheran forefathers. They talk a lot about, it's great to be here in America, and the government doesn't tell you what to believe. That was a different time, obviously. But they don't understand, and they, they don't really articulate that those liberties are not there simply because you're in America. You had those liberties wherever it is that you came from, the government simply didn't recognize that. So we can't look at America as sim simply opportunistically. We need to look at it as a place which providentially recognized, and still on paper does recognize, that God has secured to human beings freedoms and liberties which it is not right for state or church to revoke. And if those things are threatened, resistance to those threats is therefore utterly legitimate. Because it was never God's intention to enslave mankind to either state or, in the case of the history of the Missouri Synod, some very overbearing and illegitimate form of church. God has not made men's bodies and souls to be slaves to other men. Okay. So, we'll continue on with what I think is one of the clearest articulations of something that is more like thinking of ourselves as Americans, with a certain calling, therefore, in the next lecture. But I want to I pause for right now and give you a little bit extra time in this hour for questions that you've had. I've heard some good ones also in the breaks, so... If you want to bring those up for everybody, let's, let's talk about them now. Or anything that you'd like to respond to in what I just said. So, time for that now. Yes, sir. Um, it's my understanding that, in fact, there was a, um, a Lutheran that was involved uh, um, in uh, the early part of forming the U.S. Mm -hmm. there, there was one that was, uh, I forget whether it was the first or second continental congress who was like the president. Yeah, there is, um, I believe there is a Lutheran who is one of the presidents of the, the Continental Congress and then the Articles of Confederation are not actually a different group, technically. So, there is a Lutheran, um, I think from Pennsylvania, who is one of, the, one of the presidents of the Congress in that way. The first Speaker of the House, on, as I mentioned earlier, under uh, our current Constitution, uh, is Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, so that's one of Henry Melchior Muhlenberg, who is really kind of the father of American Lutheranism. That's one of Henry Muhlenberg's sons. Another of his sons, Peter, was a minister and goes into the Continental Army as a general. He's one of the generals in command at Valley Forge, for example, over that winter. So yeah, Lutherans are involved. Um, they are proportionately less involved than New Englanders, but they're, because they prevail in the middle states, Pennsylvania, Maryland, Virginia especially, they're more involved than a lot of folks in this part of the South, which is much more evenly divided between loyalists and patriots. So, yeah, Lutherans are definitely involved um, in the revolution. Nobody's as involved as the Congregationalists. Yeah. <laughs> the Congregationalists and the Continental Army are kind of like Southern Baptists in the current chaplaincy. We're like... Every second or third chaplain in the military is some kind of a Baptist, often a Southern Baptist. In the Continental Army, the chaplains are overwhelmingly Congregationalists from New England. Yeah. Other, other questions right now? Yes, sir. Go ahead. Uh, when you talk about interposition, yeah. um, maybe you would do this tonight, but like uh, Governor Abbott uh -huh. in Texas, yeah. where he said, hey, the president isn't doing this, I'm going to do it right. with the board. Yeah. Um, that would be an example, I guess, of that, from a, a lesser magistrate. Right? Yes. Uh, on the subway in Pennsylvania, wherever mm -hmm. it was, Philly. Yeah, on where, Philly. Where there was no interposition. There was no interposition. By anyone. Correct. Watching the uh, evil transfer. 
That's there. right. Yeah. So we see it on one side it going on, another not. Yeah. And it, that's a more yeah. breakdown. Okay. There. And that, that's an interesting question because interposition, the idea of when to interpose gets at what Luther mentions as absolutely essential even above knowledge of the law, what is strictly speaking the law, which is the possession of wisdom. And if a governor of a state, which you know he recognizes my state is suffering from uncontrolled immigration, I need to do something if the federal government will not, I mean, with immig immigration is a really great example where all the laws on the books are fine, we just don't enforce them. Yeah. You know? yeah. Right. Uh, but uh, that would be that would be a judgment of wisdom. Similarly, too. But think about how people how people think about what's going to happen to them if they see something heinous transpiring right next to them on a subway or something. What do they think? I'm going to get in trouble, yeah. right? And that is where thinking about legal liability dominates people's minds both individually but also organizationally, fear of legal liability rather than what is the immediately wise thing to do. So I'm worried about what's going to happen to me, therefore I can't stop what I see happening in front of me, which is obviously evil, this woman's chastity is being taken from her, because I'm worried that I myself will be prosecuted for whatever happens and whatever whatever video comes out, honestly. Right. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I have to respond to that because what happens in this room is just like the most disgusting mm -hmm. sure. thing I've ever heard. Yeah. Because people were there, yeah. nobody did anything. Yeah. But I would have to think as a person on that train, instead of thinking, oh, am I going to get in trouble, how can I... Let another human being, yeah. another child of God, yeah. see this happen to them and do nothing. Yeah. See, that's my question. Yeah, sure. Not, am I going to get in trouble if I do something? My question is, yeah. how can you see that and not react to that? Yeah. Well, and it, that also has to do in America with the dominance. So um, the idea now kind of mocked, right, because we're acquainted with it from Western movies, of a posse. What's the point of a posse? A posse is an example of citizen interposition. The government is not going to do what is supposed to do, so the citizenry will do what needs to be done. It's the same, I mean, it's a less organized form, it's the same idea that you have with a grand jury. The citizens are actually sovereign in this polity, so they need to ensure that justice is done. So this is where you get examples of you know, uh, and another example would be um, the man who uh, his, his son was abused in Louisiana in the 1980s. He was tipped off as to when this man was going to get his relatively light sentence. This is when he'll be in the airport, just letting you know if you want to stand at a payphone nearby. He shoots the man. He's tried. He is acquitted. Because the citizens recognize that he has done something that the government itself was too cowardly to do, which is to punish a man who has taken from a boy what can never be restored to him. And that, that if you want to go into what is, that is totally traditional in America. That, that's how we used to behave. Go ahead. Uh, oh, Moses yeah. was an example of interposition with the Egyptian Yeah, Lenin. yeah, right. Yeah, right. It's interesting. Uh, he made sure that the uh, justice was complete. Yeah. By putting them to death. Right. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, I see the a large part of it. In many public places in our society, we are prohibited from carrying arms. So, in order to stop that person from doing what he yeah. did on that subway, who, right. had, who had the means to do right. the battle with that person that was committing that crime? Right, right. Um, yeah. So, we're through the harm society. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I, I think when you think about the notion of um, a gun control or these kinds of things, you really need to not think so much about do I do I enjoy 
firearms or not, or something like that, you, because weaponry will exist in any society. The point of something like the Second Amendment is so that the citizenry is not defenseless over against an armed government. That's the point. The point is not that, I mean, like, you know, my, uh, I own like five guns, four guns, I don't know, not that many. My dad owns like a multiple of ten of what I own, right? Um, does he need to? Not necessarily. Is there a problem with that? No, not at all. But the point, I mean, at the time of the Second Amendment, very few people own more than a single firearm. And the firearm is not that impressive. The point is that it's yours. Okay? And because you have right of defense over your body and the body, in this case, of your neighbor. Okay? That's not... I, I don't need to wait for the police who traditionally don't exist hardly anywhere in America. They just... They're not there. America's a rural country. There's nobody... Nobody's going to come if you don't do something. And you cannot wait for someone else to enforce what is right. You either do it or it doesn't happen, which is the case on a SEPTA train because there are generally, I, that's what I used to ride to Temple uh, for graduate school. There are no policemen there. They're not going to do anything. And everyone is utterly terrified of being seen to do something that could be misunderstood. Yeah, go ahead. With the LCMS and the issue of this, the schools, the shutting down, or potential the shutting down of schools. Yeah. From a Magdeburg perspective, yeah, right. would that be viewed, what level of tyranny uh, would you think? You know, is this, yeah. was this understood to be an intentional attack upon mm -hmm. the schools or an unintentional consequence of yeah. a rule that? Right, and to be clear, um, Magdeburg is not really, if you read Walther, Walther will cite Luther at length, and he'll, excite, he'll cite other fathers from later on, but the example of Magdeburg is not one that they're using actively, unfortunately. Um, I would say that closing down schools because the instruction is in German is not at the point where the government is intentionally opposed to the church in the example where... I want to say it was Maine in 2020, where you were allowed to serve uh, the body of Christ, but not the blood, because it would entail drinking from a common cup. And why is that okay? Because the majority of people in Maine at this point in our history are Roman Catholic. So they made that regulation to accommodate Roman Catholics. So you, could go, you can go to church, 10 people, and you can serve the body of Christ. Roman Catholics are okay with that. That is, to me, a step beyond. They really didn't like them because they were, they were German immigrants. Mm -hmm. Only incidentally were they Lutheran or Roman Catholic or something. The real issue was they were almost overwhelmingly democratic. I mean, the Missouri Synod is overwhelmingly democratic until after the Second World War because the Democrat Party is largely socially conservative and doesn't support prohibition. And Missouri was way more against prohibition than any, I mean, Catholics actually had a temperance faction. We had nothing like that. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, um, so we're overwhelmingly democratic. So if Wisconsin is controlled by native-born English-speaking Republicans, this is a political attack. Incidentally, it's also an attack on Lutheran schools and therefore on Lutherans' capacity to reproduce themselves. So it's not, I don't think that's a level four, but it's at least a two or a three. Because it is causing you to sin if you cannot decide how you will raise your children as Christians. Go ahead. Did they go beyond just informing church members on how they should vote? Was there uh, other forms of resistance? Or, you know, the pastors? The pastors? Well, or yeah, so, go, how far did it go? Yeah, this? So this is an issue, and a lot of this is stuff that we decided to forget about, especially in problems surrounding the First World War. Um, but on a local level, you can see the difference in if you have any stories about how Lutheran pastors were treated. Because in some places it was fine. So if the community is largely Lutheran, it really honestly doesn't matter what is said in the state legislature. They just, 
they just keep doing it. Yeah, it really doesn't matter. If you have local control of circumstance and the sheriff favors you, it really doesn't matter that you live in a state that officially has outlawed what you're doing. Let's be honest. In places where Lutherans are in closer contact with non-Lutherans, so uh, anecdotes that I have in mind are a pastor gets whipped in the street in Texas. Well, that's because he doesn't, he can't rely on community support for what he's doing and how his church runs. And so there's there's the level on, okay, this is what Pharaoh said to do, but locally we just keep letting the babies be born versus uh, they know that our babies are being born and they're coming for them. So the, the, it really, local circumstance really, really comes to matter in cases like this. Yeah. And at the same time, how seriously do the church members themselves take these dictates? Because if everybody just agrees this is stupid, then it's not even a threat to the church's unity, let alone its functioning. Or we're just not going to do it, that's fine. Make them enforce it. Okay. Yeah, go ahead. Speaking of conscience, yeah. how can you comment on the history of jury nullification? Yeah, jury nullification is an application of a, of a basic principle that predates America, that uh, things not consonant with justice and reason can and should be nullified by various levels of government. And this, part of the reason I, part of the difficulty I think that the Missouri Senate has in America is that they don't come from a common law society, where these things are expressed in our political institutions. So if the jury wants to nullify something, do it. We're not familiar with that when we come here. We're familiar with, this guy above me said this, so that's what you got to do. Um, the idea that you would nullify things that are unjust is, and this is why, this pertains also to the justice of the Civil War, the justice of secession abstractly, is that local bodies have right of refusal about things that they see as unjust. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Well, uh, an example that people don't really think about because a lot of people are kind of unfamiliar with the, let's say, the social, the historical context of the Bible. You, ha you obviously have slaves in Christian congregations in the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Something that you wouldn't know unless you read around the New Testament in the ancient world is that slaves are, are, are generally sexually abused. Generally sexually abused. So if Paul is instructing the Christians that part of the fruit of the Spirit is a certain way of life not dominated by sexual passion, either their own or someone else's, then you will have to resist the you know, advances of your owner in order to preserve what is yours by, by God's grace, which is a, a life not dominated by, by your passions, but dominated by the mind of Christ now, right? So those are just, it, it, those are things that people don't think about because I think they presume that Paul just was agreeing with everything that was going on in his world. And he is, in fact, not. He's just not always making it absolutely clear when he is going to require them to disagree with what is normal. Yeah, we're just about at time. Um, let me say this, and then we'll, we'll break for lunch. Um, as we go into the fourth lecture, one of the commonalities that I think you'll find is I outline what Walter A. Meyer said and what we said in this lecture is that uh, we have to figure out how to answer our vocation as a church in this specific country, which I think the thing that we have to get used to is that requires a lot more of us than just existing and hoping that we will be left alone. And if we're not going to be left alone, and it's increasingly clear that we won't be left alone, then obviously much more will be required simply to keep the church doors open. And that's the vocation that I think Meyer was trying to answer when he gave the lecture that we'll talk about in the last lecture tonight. All right? 
Thanks, everybody.